The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Sebek, and I'm a postdoc working with Professor Barbara Stadis, and uh, he has a uh, personal emergency today, so he couldn't make it. So actually, P Pepe and I uh, will give a lecture today. And just for a reminder, uh, you can turn in your uh, first homework uh, today, uh, you know, before class or after class. OK, so the last time, actually yesterday, uh, we talked about a bunch of different things. The first one, uh, we derived, uh, by the way, uh, we are gonna <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we are gonna do the same thing, the uh, same format. So if you have any question, just feel free to interrupt and ask uh, uh, ask questions. Okay. So the uh, last last time uh, we talked about the uh, we <coughs> excuse me. We actually derived the uh, ray transfer matrix for thin lens, which has the spherical lens has two curvature, the first one and second one, which is here the one. 1 and negative 1 over f, f is focal length, and 1 is 0. And the focal length, 1 over f, is, is actually, we derive this equation, the lens Menkes equation. So if you have the, uh, if you know the refractive index and the radius coverture, the left side and right side, and you can just uh, easily compute the focal length of your thin lens. When also we talked about uh, the object at infinity and the image at infinity. So for example, in this case, uh, we have the object at infinity, so we have uh, this rays is coming uh, from the infinity, and we're gonna have the, the focused uh, point at the focal plane. That's the definition of the focal uh, length and focal plane. And the other way, we have if we have the point object at focal plane, then we're going to have an image at infinity. So uh, uh, that's the uh, same thing. And if we have the negative lens, which has I mean, the, whose focal length is negative, then we have the same thing. We have a uh, parallel coming in. In this case, it bends outside. But if you extract, then extend, then we have the uh, uh, foc uh, focal point here. So as you know, the object and image, they are conjugate. And in this case, one of the object or image is at infinity. So we call it, I mean, this configuration uh, as infinite conjugate. Uh, dark and please. Yeah. Because you know, one of them is at infinity. So, yeah, that's what we talked about uh, yesterday. And today we're going to talk, uh, we're going to be talking a more interesting uh, topic. So, what if we have uh, our object or an image is at finite distance? It's more uh, realistic, case. just like when you take a picture of your person, I mean, of your a friend, then your friend is not going to be at infinity, right? So it's more real realistic case. And then we'll talk about uh, thick lens, because uh, so far we just assume our lens is infinitely thin, so thick lens is more uh, like the realistic case. And then the Pepe will talk about the uh, human, visual, uh, human visual system. So I guess uh, this slide is probably one of the most important slides of this whole course, because you know uh, we are uh, dealing with the uh, object and image at finite distance. So the situation is like this: we have a, a lens whose focal length f, and in object space we are given an object at some distance, and our task is you know the situation is like this: you have a camera and you want to take a picture of a person, then. What if, uh, where, should, where should I put uh, my screen or detector? Or in the other way around, you know, there must be a, uh, some condition that makes a perfect image, right? So if you take a picture of it at some distance and the other object, which is not at that distance, will, be, will look blurry in your uh, final image, right? So we are going to find 
uh, what condition should be uh, satisfied here in terms of the distance in object space and focal length and distance in image space. And we are going to see uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of image we will get or how big it is. Okay? So the first one is, uh, what is the image? So what is the image? So image is you know, just a replica of an object, right? So in terms of this ray picture, we have uh, infinite number, uh, infinite number of arrays. Oops. Oh, sorry. So infinite number of rays uh, emanating from the uh, object uh, point. Then, and if this configuration is uh, imaging uh, configuration, which means you make the perfect image then all these rays, at least most of them, they should be converged at a point in object space somewhere, right? So that's the image condition. You have a bunch of rays coming from this point, and they should met at one point. So you can draw uh, many, many rays, but all your choice is just two rays here. So this, uh, let me. Uh, this first ray and the second ray. And since every ray should uh, meet at one point in uh, image space, these two rays also should meet at the same point. And the reason why we choose these only two rays is uh, kind of obvious, because we know the infinite conjugate conf configuration, right? So the first ray, the upper ray here, uh, let me see. this ray, is it looks like coming from the uh, object infinite, right? It's parallel to the optical axis. So the after, the, uh, after the lens, it should pass the focal point uh, like this. And we call this point uh, as back focal plane, since it is behind the uh, lens. And what about the, the second ray here? So if we choose that ray, it's passing through the uh, focal point which is in front of the lens, we call the front focal plane. Then, you know, after the, uh, at the lens, it looks like coming from the uh, focal, point, uh, focal point, right? So it should be uh, going uh, to the infinity. So it collimated and parallel to the optical axis. And these two rays uh, meet at this point. So that point is the where you get the image, and the other rays, the infinite number of rays, should meet I should meet at that point. Okay, so this is the uh, how we def how we draw the the configuration image. So we have bunch of ray and bunch of ray in, uh, image space. Any questions so far? Okay. So to find the relation between you know, the object distance and image distance. Let's define uh, two uh, distance here. So first one is x naught, the distance from the object to the fo front focal plane. And the second one is xi, so from the back focal point to the image. So we're going to see uh, how they are, are relate to the focal lengths here. So first thing is we can compare uh, two big uh, triangles here. So. For the first one is oops. this triangle O P F F and this one B C F F. Since they are similar, right? So if you <coughs> see uh, this height of P O and this B C is is same as H, this actually they are H object over H, H X O, so H O and X O, and should be same as negative H I, so negative sign is because H I is negative, so to make the positive, you have to put uh, the negative sign here, and this length is F, right? So you get this first uh, relation, and you can uh, compare the same, uh, the other triangle triangles uh, at image space. 
So this A, C, F, B, and I, Q, F, this one. So if you do the same thing, then we have the, this relation. So Q, I, is which is the image height, and F, P, Q, this is X, I. And we have the H, the object height over uh, focal length. So we have this relation and the second relation. So if you combine them, uh, we have uh, two interesting equations here. The first one is h, the image height over x, or the object height, should be, is a, xi over h o equal to negative f over x o, and it's also the same as negative xi over x. Can anyone guess what this quantity means? So hi over x. Hi over HO, so image height over image, uh, object height. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but he said magnification. <laughs> yeah, because you know this is a ratio of the relative si the size of the image and object. So this actually this term indicates the magnification of your imaging system, right? So if magnification actually is defined by actually defined by like this, just H I over H O, and if the magnific mag the absolute value of magnification is larger than one, then you're gonna get the magnified uh, image, because the image height is bigger than object height, right? And if it is smaller than one, you're gonna get the, uh, the smaller image, right? And if you combine the rest, these two equations, so f over x and x, xo and xi over f, then you can get the, this equation, xo and xo times xi should be uh, f square, which means, so xo is the this distance, so object to the focal plane, the front focal plane, and xi is from back focal plane to the image plane. So this tells you, uh, where, you where should you put uh, the detector or object to make an imaging condition, right? So they are related like this. So this is, on, uh, is one of the form of the imaging condition, and we call it a Newton's form, okay? And sometimes it's more uh, convenient to define the distance from object to the lens, not the focal plane. So we define two other distance. So SO, so object distance from object to the lens, and image distance, SI, from lens to image. And actually in this, in this figure, we can draw uh, another way, which is from object to the image, but it passed through the center of the lens. And it looks like just a pass, a straight through the lens. And can anyone guess why? Uh, because at the center of the uh, lens, at the very center, the radius curvature is kind of infinite, right? So it just looks like, you know, just piece of piece of flat glass. So if you have the piece of glass, then you know from the Snell's law, the, inc the incident ray and the outgoing ray, they, sh they are parallel, right? And if you have the same medium here and here. And also we talk about, uh, we are talking about the very thin lens here. So we don't really uh, consider the thickness uh, thickness of the lens, so that's why the that way, just that way looks like just passing straight through the lens. So you can draw actually three uh, rays here. So the first one, uh, first one, this one, and this one, and this one, and then you can uh, compare uh, two, actually another tri big triangles. So O C A, this one, and I Q C, this one. So if you compare that triangle, then we're gonna get the uh, so C A over C B. So uh, C A and C B, which is the actually magnification here, H H O of negative H I, should be same as this object distance 
and image distance. So, so the, this, this tells you if you have the object distance and image distance, they are related to the magnification. So if your object is very far away from the uh, lens, then you're going to get very smaller image, right? Because you have, actually, uh, so you have the very big one here, so you're going to get the smaller one. But if you move your object to the lens, then you'll, there are a big chance you go, you're going to get the uh, magnified one, uh, magnified image. And if you and if you combine this equation and this relation and these two, then we are going to have the SI over SO, but S and it's same as F over XO, but XO is actually so XO is actually SO minus F, right? So SO minus F, and if you uh, yeah, let me do the dark end, please. So let me rewrite that equation. Uh, I just flip the uh, numerator and denominator. So SO over SI is same as SO minus F and F. And it should be same as SO over F and is minus 1, right? And I divide uh, by SO here. So I get 1 over SI should be 1 over F. No, I just flipped the denominator and denominator. So it was SO as SI over SO, but I write, I wrote SO over SI. So this one also flipped, right? SO over, SO minus F over F. And I end up with 1 over SI equal to 1 over F minus 1 over SO, which is the final equation. So we call this lens law. So 1 over object distance plus 1 over image distance should be 1 over F. So yeah. So actually, that's the equation that we, uh, in most, most of time, we are going to use. OK. So we just finished the, probably one of the most important uh, slides. Any questions? So by using this equation, we can uh, analyze uh, uh, different uh, situations. So let's first see the four different situations here. We have uh, positive lens and negative lens. And the upper left situation is what we just described. Uh, object, I mean, actually, the object distance is longer than front focal length. So you draw the two rays, the upper one and right one, and you just trace them, and they meet at one point, and you're going to get the image. And we call this one as a real image, because all these rays, uh, MRA uh, is uh, departing at that point. They actually meet at this point. So if you put a screen, then and you can actually see those uh, image of your object. So that's why we call the real image, and it's inverted, right? Because it was uh, going upright, it's down, uh, it's down right. And you no know, magnification is is definitely a small is negative because inverted, and also. Uh, if you, if you see the, the distance, object distance, this one and this one, then you can easily see you're going to have, uh, actually, it depends on the uh, object distance, but yeah. And if you, in, in, terms, in terms of equation, so this SO is bigger than focal length, right? So this 1 over SO is actually smaller than 1 over F. So actually, the SI should be positive. You know, you know, you need to add something, right? Because this one is smaller than this one. So that's why we have the SI, which is positive distance here. But if you think about um, this situation, so object distance now is smaller than focal length, is closer, is closer than the front, fo uh, front focal plane, then you can still draw these two rays. One is parallel to the optical axis. And the other one is passing through the front focal plane. But after the lens, actually, they don't meet because they are uh, diverging. So if you uh, backtrace, then they actually meet in front of the lens. So we call this as a, this as a, a virtual image. 
because it looks like coming from that point. But if you put a screen there, there are uh, just like so Singapore. Uh, I'm not using the dark line uh, right now. So okay, thanks. So so if you put the screen there, then you don't really see the actual, actual image. It just looks like uh, these two rays uh, behind the lens. They they look coming from this point. So that's the definition of the virtual image. And as you can see here, we have the uh, erect image, and it's bigger than the original object, which is green. So magnification is bigger than one. In terms of equation, so now SO is smaller than F. So 1 over SO is actually bigger than 1 over F, right? So actually, this guy should be negative, which means SI also should be negative. And which indicate your image distance is negative. So you are going to have the image in front of your lens. Right? And the negative lens, you know, uh, we have the negative focal length here. So that's why the front focal plane is actually behind the lens, not the in front of the lens. So you can still draw these two rays, but they don't meet. They, have the, they make a virtual image in front of the lens. And we have the uh, virtual and erect image and mag magnification. It, it, we get actually the smaller image. And if you do the same thing here, uh, we are going to get the virtual erect and the also smaller image. OK. OK, so, so, so far we just talked about the thin lens and how they make the image. Like for, but, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Pepe will pass around this, uh, the convex lens, which, is, uh, which was the, the upper case. So you're going to see, if you move your uh, screen or eyes, then you can see, actually, it was inverted, but it's erect. So you can see, you have to see the flipped image, right? So it's going to pass around. So one, one way to do it is just look at the lens, look at your, uh, your, your notebook. And if you have it just at the right distance, the, the image would look inverted and floating on top of the, uh, the lens, which is the real image. And if you put it closer, which means that now we have the second case there, the image will be erect, so not inverted anymore, and will look behind the lens, right? So it's actually pretty dramatic, the change. Yeah. So actually, the, the upper right configuration is the exact same form as magnifier. So you know magnifier that <coughs> detective are using. So yeah. So next question is, what if we have uh, multiple lenses, like this, this case? So here we have two lenses. Uh, each one has a focal length of 10. So let's say unit is millimeter. So the focal length is just 10 millimeter, 10 millimeter, and the gap between the lens is 5 millimeter. And we are given an object, which is the distance from the object to the first lens is just 5 millimeter. And we want we want to find. Uh, what kind of image we get and where it is at somewhere around here. So can anyone guess uh, how to do it? Because we just talked about the, the single, lens, a single lens, but what if we have the multiple lenses? No? Yeah, so actually, the answer is pretty straightforward. So you just cascade, which means you first consider the first lens. So you just find the image of the object through the first lens. And that image becomes the object to the second, the second lens. And you do the same thing, you find the image. And if you have more lens, you just repeat the same process. Okay? So let's first try it. So here I just consider, I just neglect the, the second lens. I only have the first lens which has the object distance 5 millimeter, and the focal length is 10. So I can draw the two or three rays to find the image. But to be precise, I just plug in the equation. So 1 over 5, which is the, this distance. The 5 is this distance. And we're going to, we want to find the image distance. If it is positive, then we're going to get real image. But if it is negative, then we're going to get the virtual image here. And should be. 1 over 10, which is focal length, right? And it turns out that this S prime, this image distance, is actually negative 10. 
So which means uh, we have the negative image, which is in front of the lens. So this distance is 10 millimeter. And if you compare the magnification, which is defined by the object distance and image distance, so it is negative. There is a negative sign. So negative, negative, negative 10 over 5 is actually 2. So we, are, we have uh, uh, erect virtual image, which is twice larger than original image. This is the first lens. And this image is now uh, an object to the second lens. So we had the uh, virtual image here, which was the 10 millimeter in front of the lens. But if you th only think about second lens, then this uh, object distance should be 15 millimeter, right? So if you do the same thing, so now we have the 1 over 15 from here to here. And we want to find the image distance. 1 over s prime should be 1 over 10, uh, which is just a uh, positive 30 millimeter. So we, so we are going to get, after 30 millimeter, we are going to have the real image. And if you compare the man, magnification of the second lens, then it's negative 30 over 15. So we have the negative 2. So we have the, uh, the real image here, which is inverted one. And that is twice larger than this virtual, I mean, the object of the second image. So if you, so the overall magnification, because, you know, Actually, we initially had a two lens like this. So the overall magnification is just multiplication of individual magnification. So first one was plus the, but positive 2, and this is negative 2. So the final magnification is minus 4. So the, an the answer to the question is we're going to have the inverted the real image behind, behind the, the second lens, uh, which is 30 millimeter behind the second lens and which is four times larger than the original object. So if you have fewer lengths, like two or three, then this approach is pretty straightforward, right? You just consider one by one and just apply the lens law, and you're going to get the uh, right answer. OK. So. The previous slide, we just derived the imaging condition, which was the XO times XI should be F square, or 1 over SO plus 1 over SI is 1 over F. We just derived those equations from the geometry, right? Those, the, we just compare the, tri the few triangles and uh, get the, uh, the final uh, equation. Well, I can do the same thing with the ray matrix transform. So uh, let me do uh, a dark end, please. So, so the way you do it is, you know, in the uh, way transfer matrix, you first define the angle and height in object space and image, right? So here I have uh, alpha i and x i, which is this angle and the height of the image. Uh, let me write h i actually. And the input was x o and h o, which was this angle and this height. And as the as ray, you know, is propagating from left to right, but I write the matrix from right to left. Right. The first thing is the propagation from here to here, so which is the distance by uh, s o. So the first matrix should be. Uh, 1, 0, uh, S, 1. Am I right? Oh, S, O, oh, yes. OK, so we just first consider from here to here. And then you have the lens, which was, we just derived the uh, last time, which was 1, negative 1 over F, 0, and 1. And the next one is from here to here, right? The same uh, propagation. So we have 1, 0, SI, 1. 
So this is the uh, matrix formulation in this case. So if I compute these matrices, then actually I get this equation. So let me write S O F S I plus S O minus S I S O F one over F one minus I over F two. So can anyone guess? I mean, can anyone explain the imaging condition from this matrix? So we just derive the relation between. Uh, angle and height in object, but angle and height in image. And we have the transfer matrix here. So what's the, the imaging condition in this case? Uh, so let's go back to the uh, first thought. So what, is, what was the image? So we have the bunch of different uh, bunch of rays uh, starting from the object point, and they all they arrive at the same point in the image, right? So if you just come, uh, think about the H, I, and H, O here, so at that point, so all these rays have the same height, H, O, but they have different H, uh, alpha, O, these guys, right? But at the image side, the same thing. So all those rays, uh, these rays, they have the same height, H, I, but they have different, uh, different angle, alpha, I. So if you just compare the H I and H O, you know, those rays, even though they have different angles, but they have the same height, which means it's independent, which means actually this H I, so H I actually sh should be independent on alpha zero, because no matter how they, how they, uh, how they depart at that point, they have the same height here, right? So the answer is actually this term, because you know this is alpha i and h i. So this term should be zero, because you know as I just described, h i should be independent on alpha uh, alpha object. Right? So if I do the math, then this is one over, I just divide by S O and S I. So this one is one over S O plus one over S I minus one over F should be zero, which is, uh, which is uh, again, the Lenz law. Okay. Yeah, so that's the, what I just described. And uh, if I plug in uh, this equation, I mean, in this matrix, and I get uh, this, uh, finally, I get these matrices. So if I continue at this equation, then minus x over f, 1 over uh, f, 0, uh, minus xi over f. So the upper right term, we, st we still have one over negative one over f, which is uh, lens power or optical power. And what is this term? The upper no 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 the uh, this the the last term negative x i over f. Can anyone answer? It's easy one. Uh, press the button, please. Magnification. Yes, because since this term is zero, so if you think about the second row here, then you have the H I is just uh, this guy multiplied by H O, right? So if you just think about the second <coughs> element here, then H I is negative X I over F, which is H O, or object height. So this term is actually tells you the relation between the object height and image height, which is the magnification. 
So I should say the lateral magnification, because we are talking about the size. So this term is magnification. And it, and it turns out that the upper left term, this term, is actually uh, we call the angular magnification, because that is related with the alpha i and alpha o. To be more precise, actually, angular magnification is defined by the uh, ratio of change in object ang the image angle and object angle. And if you do the math, then we finally get the this term, negative x over f. And it turns out that the angular magnification is actually vulnerable uh, lateral magnification. Um, yes. Yeah. What's yes. the what's the idea of angular magnification? Uh, we understand that lateral magnification means how much the object is scaled. Yes. Um, but in the case of imaging, how what what does it mean? Uh, yeah, that's actually a good question. So actually, if you see the definition of the angular magnification, it's actually there is a delta, right? So this delta alpha, I mean change in uh, image angle and change over change in uh, object angle, which means let's think about those two rays here and here. So you have the object uh, uh, ray angle in object space and another ray in image space. If you change this angle in object space, then you're gonna also change the I mean angle in ray. I mean in this side the image space. So actually the angular magnification tells you how they are related. So if you change this much, then how, uh, uh, what, is, what do you get in this side? How much, um, how much change, change you get in, uh, in image space? So that's the, I guess that's the proper uh, interpretation of uh, angular magnification. Is the answer to your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And does it relate yeah. to numerical aperture or in some sense? Uh, sure. Actually, the angular magnification is x all over f, right? Um, mm. Yeah. Oh, uh, not really. Yeah, it just depends on the, uh, you know, in this case, we don't have the notion of the size of the lens. Yeah. yeah. yeah so it's yeah. not related. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, thanks. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I'm supposed to go very slowly, but <laughs> there's no question. Uh, then uh, let's do. Uh, let's talk about the next topic, the so thick lens. So so far we just think about just thin lens. All these uh, ray transfer matrices or imaging condition. We just consider the thin lens, which has the two curvature, but we didn't really account for the thickness of the lens. But if you think about the real lens, we just uh, seen uh, those co the biconvex lens. Actually, they have finite thickness, right? like this. So you have the first surface and second surface, but it has the finite thickness. So what is the, what is the more uh, accurate, or I should say more rigorous way to model, to make a model for this lens? So obvious, this answer is uh, obvious, right? So you just first uh, think the Reflection at first surface, and just propagate the rays inside the glass, right? And then think the second reflection at the uh, second surface. So that's the, you know, the proper way to uh, describe. So I can do the uh, ray transfer matrix here. Uh, that, yeah. So we have we start with the alpha one and x one, which is the angle and height. In, up, uh, in left side and alpha two and x two. So it's alpha two and x two and alpha one and x one. And the first metric should be the refraction at this first surface. So it should be uh, one negative uh, left to right and R one one zero. By the way, is R one is positive or negative? 
the R1 is the, the curvature, radius of curvature this first surface. Oh, we talked about the last time. Uh, if the center of the radius curvature is uh, that way, I mean, which is the pos uh, positive way, then this radius curvature is positive. So actually, R1 is positive. And next metric should be propagation from first surface to the second surface, which is uh, 1, 0, d over n. So don't forget n in denominator, because it's not L. The ray is propagating through inside the glass. Right? And uh, the last, the third, uh, the last uh, matrix is matrix should be one and minus negative uh, left to right and radius curvature one zero. So these three matrices uh, describe this thick lens, right? So we just consider the two refraction and the propagation through the glass. And if I compute these matrices, then I get then actually M21, M22. So I'll get the four different elements, right? Which is I just, so actually, if you compute those three matrices, I get this one, but I just sim symbolize M11 and M12 yeah, and M2. Uh, which one? D over N. Yeah, because you know, distance is D, but the refractiveness N. So you need to divide by N. So, yeah. And as you know, if we, because the previously uh, we had a thin lens, which is uh, just thin lens like this, and incoming ray, they converge at point like this, and this was focal length, right? And the ray transfer matrices, matrix for this thin lens was one, negative one over F, zero, and one. So we get the, yes? Oh, uh, where? Uh, okay. Oh, left, right. Oh, sorry, yes. All right. So it should be n minus 1 and 1 minus n. Yeah, it's confusing. <laughs> no. Uh, actually, the way I remember is the uh, refractive index at left side minus the uh, refractive index right side, but there was negative sign. So yeah, I, I, got, I got wrong. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. So what I was going to talk about is we have, uh, if we have the thin lens, then the ray transfer matrices, matrix should be, it was the one, negative one over F and one zero. But now we have the thick lens. That's why we have complicated these four terms. But we get the same analogy of this term, because this term describes the, how much ray band, right? So optical power or lens power. So we get the same thing here, which is actually this complicated term. Um, this term, and since it is a uh, thick lens, we define a new quantity, which is uh, effective focal length. So we consider that term as a single quantity, which was negative uh, one of our effective focal length. So effective focal length is actually the quantity inside, inside the bracket. So m minus one, and one of our r1 minus one of our r2, and we have extra term. So what is this term, the m minus one and one over R1 minus one over R2. Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, 
Actually, that's the what I described at the very first slide, right? So that's the uh, lens maker's equation. So focal length of thin lens, and you can compute the focal length from the refractive index and radius curvature, right? But now we have thick lens, so we have extra term. It's function of the the d, the distance from the first and second surface. So if actually the effective, so if you consider thick lens, then the effective focal length is not same as the focal length, right? So we just find the. Where's the focal length measured from? Yeah, is it from the middle what lens? That's I was going to talk about. Yeah. Okay. So we just find the effective focal length of the thick lens, but yeah, exactly where the focus will, uh, where the focus will be. Uh, that's the next question, right? Because we we didn't define any uh, planes yet. So let's think about it. So first one is back focal plane. So we have the uh, we have an object at infinity. So we have the uh, ray parallel to the optical axis, and they bend twice here and here, and finally they're gonna make a focus at here. So this is focal plane, and we can define the focal length from this point. So okay, and I can do the uh, ray. So this I can do the ray to find that point. Actually, the this distance, right? So this distance tells you. Actually, we. We define this distance as back focal plane. So from the second surface of the lens to this uh, back focal plane. And so what I'm going to do is find the dis distance by ray transfer matrix. So what I do is, OK, the so same as before, uh, alpha 2 and x2, which is here. But you know, the x2 is 0, because it is on the, on the optical axis, right? So this is actually 0. And input is alpha 1 and x1, this one. So this x1 and angle. But since it is parallel to the optical axis, the so alpha 1 is 0. And I just derived the the ray transfer matrix of the thick lens, this guy. I mean this whole guy. So I have M11, M12, M21, M22. And it's not the end, right? So we have to propagate again from here to here by distance uh, Z B. So it's going to be one zero D B one. Right. So if you solve this equation, then so this is just I uh what I've written. So we have the one zero Z B one and this is uh, M matrices. And if you solve this equation then we get two two results, right? We have the uh two equations. So one is alpha two is negative x one and effective focal length. So this sign means you know this alpha two uh, is heading downward. So the amplitude means x uh, x one over effective focal length. And z v z b is actually effective focal length uh, times one minus this guy. So in this case, actually the z b is bigger than effective focal length or smaller than effective focal length. You know, so in this case, n is bigger than one, so this guy is positive. So z b is actually smaller than effective focal length, right? Wake up, guys! <laughs> right. So we co we define this distance z b as a back focal length, and we just talk about the effective focal length, the quantity in the bracket, and the one of our effective focal lengths is. Uh, Power, the lens power or optical power of this thick lens. So this distance is the fact focal length, which is the answer to your question. And we can do the same thing in the other side. So 
So we start from the point. We don't know where it is yet, but the, po the focal point in front of the lens, which is front focal plane, front focal point, and they bend twice, and finally they get collimated because you know it's going to the image at infinity. So the way matrix is in this case. Uh, alpha 2 and x2, and alpha 1 and x1. But we now we start from the point on the optical axis. So x1 should be 0. And at the end, we are going to have the x2, but alpha 2 equals 0. So this should be 0. And first matrices we should consider is this propagation by ZF, right? So it's going to be 1, 0, ZF, 1. And then we have the thick lens. So M11, M12, M21, M22. And if you solve the, this equation, then we also get the same uh, two results, so which is the front focal length, which is ZF from here to here. And this is what you get. And the second one in X2 is alpha 1 and alpha 1 times effective focal length. Okay. Any question? Uh, I guess it's time to break. Uh, yeah, uh, let's, let's take a break here. So, I, so next time, I'm, gonna, I'm going to continue uh, to explain this front focal length and back focal length and how they are related. And uh, meantime, we have the demo set up here. So uh, you're welcome to uh, come and see. And what we have uh, here is actually the imaging setup. We have a single lens here and object, which is the resolution target, and we have a screen here. So if you move this screen back and forth, or lens, or yeah, lens and the image, right? We cannot move all of this. So we will see, basically, we're going to demonstrate the imaging condition. So if the distance is proper, uh, properly aligned, uh, properly uh, located, then we're going to see the very nice image. But if not, then the image looks blurry. So uh, before we continue with all the math, uh, some of you came to see the demo, and for the, the ones that didn't come, I suggest you to come after class. It's easier to see the images that we try to form because we don't have the dynamic range problem that any camera has. But anyways, the main idea of this demo is to show what we've been learning about an imaging of a single lens, right? So if you can summarize at this point so far what we've learned. We've learned thin lenses, thick lenses, right? So it's just a refractive element that is capable of forming an image from a given point, either at infinity or a close distance, to another plane. That's what we learned. Another important point that we've learned today is the imaging condition, right? Imaging condition is just depending on three variables. The distance from the lens to the image plane, SI, the distance from the lens to the object plane, SO, and the focal length, right? This is one of the most important things because um, Basically, this tells you, if I want to have an in-focus, very sharp, nice image, I can either play with two of these par uh, variables, keep one constant. So for example, in this demo, what I'm going to show you is how a single lens, a positive lens, performs imaging of a thin transparency. So in this case, I'm going to start showing here how I'm illuminating this transparency, which is here. It's just a piece of glass that has some dark coated lines of different sizes. It's called a resolution target. And we're illuminating these with white light from the back. So it's just like a transparency for an overhead projector you can think of. Then this is a positive lens here that will basically is a, a form an image at another screen here, right? So now let's, let's, th let's look at these quantities physically that we've learned in the math here. This distance from here to here is the object distance. That's the SO from the equation. This lens has a fo fixed focal length, which I cannot change. It's just a piece of glass curved in a given way. So this distance here is a distance to the image plane. 
So these two distances, I really can change A, to get a sharp focus to make sure that my image is exactly at my screen, and or if I want to play with the magnification. Because remember from the math, if you can see the notes before, that the magnification, the lateral magnification, depends on the ratio of minus SI, which is this distance, over SO, which is this distance, right? So let's lower the exposure here just to see the image that we have here, please. All right, so we lower the exposure again for the same reasons of, of, um, of um, dynamic range. So I'm going to try to focus here on the image. So this is the image that we are forming on the screen. And as you can see, it's, um, it's, so, so there's a bunch of lines, stripes, and, and, and squares with numbers. And it's very sharply in focus. Okay, so so now what I'm going to do, and hopefully we, we can see it with a camera, is that I'm going to change the ratio between these two distances. So what if, for example, I want to demagnify, demagnify my image? So the magnification quantity that I just described, SI over SO, forget about the minus, minus sign. The minus sign just tells you that it's an inverted image. Uh, SI over SO, I, wanna, I, I want that quantity smaller. What should I do? OK, I'm going to repeat the question one more time. Magnification equal to 1. I want magnification, say, less than 1. How can I reduce that m number? m equals minus si over so. What? Move. OK, just push the buttons and repeat what you just said. Uh, increase the uh, distance SO so you move closer to the screen. So if I move the lens closer to the screen, effectively I reduce SO, increase, I'm sorry, reduce SI, the imaging distance. So let's try it. So I'm going to move this lens closer to this side. So SO increases, of course. And I can just look at the right position here for focus. So now this distance is smaller. And it's hard to see with a webcam, but the image is still in focus. It's smaller, demagnified respect to the one that I showed you before. Uh, but yeah, that basically we accomplished this, right? So for this part, if you can come and play with these distances later after class, you'll see how this relationship works, right? So in this case, <coughs> we have these two variables, the SO and SI that we're playing at. But as we'll see in a second, for the eye, it's a very different, different story. Because in the eye, the lens of the eye and the retina, so in this case would be your SI, is fixed. You cannot change it. It's the shape of your eye. So how can the eye focus far distance objects or when you read nearby objects? So it has to do similar tricks playing in the imaging conditions such that it always has a sharp image. The way the eye does it, and we'll see it in a second, is by changing the focal length. So now the two variables become f and so, and you can do the same trick. So this was a positive lens. We've learned about negative power lenses, so the ones that are curved like this, right? So in these ones, we've learned that these generate these weird, non-intuitive virtual images, right? So I was just asking to the students that came here, uh, what did they expect to see if I put this lens here? Anyone wants to guess, other than the students that already answered the question? What do you think we will have? We, it, it, let me put it in this way. Would I see an image, and where? Or should I not see anything if I put this negative lens? Image or no image? Singapore? Unless you form the image with another lens, you don't see it. OK, let's try it. I put the negative lens. Actually, I'm going to put it in this. Oh. We lost the video. Give me just one second.
All right. So I put the, the negative lens. Let me move it back and forth. And yeah, you can see how I have just a bright patch of light, no image, right? So you said that if we use another lens, we can make that image into a real image. What type of lens do you think we need to add and where? OK, I'll answer that one. OK, your answer? An answer? Um, a positive lens after the negative lens, b before the negative uh, screen. Exactly. Yep. So essentially, physically, what this is doing is that the light going out from the object gets even uh, bent out outwards more, right? So it basically essentially forms a virtual object behind the lens, right? So the positive lens, what it's going to do is grab these outward rays and focus them back into the screen to form an image. And let's just try it. Now I have the two lenses. Just make sure that the exposure is, we're reducing the exposure. Oh, it's hard to see here, but there's lines again, right? So then we have an image. So essentially, as I was mentioning before, this is what our eye would do for us when we see virtual images. We have a virtual image, and our eye is, is the lens that focuses this light and converts this virtual image into a real image, right? We'll understand more how the, the eye works in a second. So I think we're going to switch back to uh, the normal class mode. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, so we were talking about the thick lens. So by using uh, weight transfer matrices, we just derived the effective focal length of a thick lens, and we define the back focal plane, a back, back focal length, and the front focal length, which is function of effective focal length. Okay. And so let's see uh, uh, how they are related. The first one. Uh, you know, we have the infinite conjugate configuration. So we have in object at infinity, and at back focal plane, we have focus. And we just derive the two equation, which is alpha 2 is x1 over effective focal length, and back focal length is you know, effective focal length times some extra factor. And what I'm going to do here is I just the I just measure the effective focal length from the back focal plane. And since the back focal length, which means the back focal plane to the, the, second, the, the second surface is shorter than the effective focal length. So actually, in this case, we're going to have the plane, the virtual plane inside of the glass, inside the glass. And from that equation, which is alpha 2 and alpha 2 equals x1 minus x1 over effective focal length. And it turns out that if you uh, extend uh, this ray over here and this ray over here, and they actually meet at that plane. So it's essentially, you can, you can think, even though you have thick lens, but you have th th thin lens there. So ray just, just uh, you know, propagating st from straight and at that, this plane and bend and make a focus there. So we call this plane a second uh, principal plane because it's associated with the back focal plane. So this is second pla uh, principal plane. And you can do the same thing in the other side, of course. So we have the front focal plane. When, and I measure from here to here by effective focal length. And effective focal length is actually longer than the front focal plane, ZF, from here to there. So it's still inside, of, inside the glass. And if you extend the, those rays, and actually they met 
they meet at the, uh, this plane. So we call this first principle plane. So I just put these two figures together. So I have thick lens, and we have the front focal point, and this distance to the, the surface of the lens is front focal length, and we define the same thing here. So we have the back focal point, and we define the back focal length from here to here. And since we, you know, from the uh, ray, twist, ray transfer matrix, we define the effective focal length of this thick lens. So we, so we define the first principal plane and second principal plane, and that's the, the effective focal length. And so conceptually, this thick lens can be assumed. You know, we, we already computed ray transfer matrices, right? So we can conceptually think we have the le thin lens, but each the, the first surface and the infinitely thin lens, the first surface and second surface is actually the first principal plane and the second principal plane. And if you have, you know, if you remember the infinite conjugate uh, configuration, if ray from the object at infinity, so it's propagating, propagating parallel to the optical axis, then it bends at the second principal plane and makes focus at back focus plane. And same thing here, if you have the point object at the, the front focal plane, and it bends at the first principal plane and collimate it and go to the infinity. So actually, the reason, reason why we introduced this concept, the principal plane and effective focal length is, uh, is actually pretty simple. Because you know, we just we start with the thin lens, but now we have the thick lens. So if, what if we have multiple lenses, like thick lens? So no matter how complicated the optical system is, we can always find the effective focal length and this uh, first and second principal plane. So once we have this uh, first and the second principal plane and effective focal length, F here, then you can treat this whole system as a one thin lens. So for example, come on. So we have the object and object space and ray, you know, we, we, it's exactly the same as a thin lens. We, we, we choose two rays, right? So first one is bent at the second principal plane and it passed through the back focal plane back focal point, sorry. And the second ray was the, it's, it goes through the, goes, goes through the front focal point and it bends at the, the first principal plane and that, and it's collimated. And they meet at some point, so you can easily find the image. Even though your system is pretty complicated, but once you find this two principal plane and effective focal length, and you can just do the, uh, you can, uh, you can still use the same equation as a thin lens, like uh, come on, yeah, all these equations. So x, you, you can you can define the same thing, x o and s o, the image distance and object distance like this, and you can use the same equation. So Newton's form x o times x i equals to f square, and the lens law one over object distance plus one over image distance should be one over f. So f is effective for length in this case. And the magnification, the lateral magnification and angular magnification, they define the same way. And I, ju I just want to mention that the, yes? Um, where is So actually, the effective focal length is depend on the, the stuff inside of the, your optical system. So the thick lens, we just consider one thick lens. So one, so one surf for the first surface, and lens, and second surface. But the, I'm going to uh, actually derive, I mean, talk about the later, but what if we have two lens? So we first consider first lens, and propagation, and the second lens. So you can define the same way. You can define the, sa the effective focal length the same way, OK? So in this case, the effective focal length is not related to the uh, aperture or whatever. It just depends on the uh, refractive index and distance from distance 
uh, between the uh, optical elements. The dis yeah, distance between the, the elements, right? Okay, so that's the width of the lens. Yes. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah. over here we have this duality between X uh, object and X image, but we always have one F. Is that only because we're assuming that the lens yeah. has the same radius of curvature on either side for now, or is it no, no. always just one F? No, no. So, uh, so effective focal length is, you know, just function of, uh, yeah, maybe it's, it's confusing, but the so in this thick lens, the effective focal length is just function of the radius curvature and refractive index and d, right? And since we so the concept of this effective focal length and principal plane, we treat the whole system as one thin lens, and one thin lens has the same focal length in, in front uh, front side and rear side, right? So effective focal length is always same, you know, in front side and, and the back side of the lens. Okay, but it depends on the system. Because right now we, I just talk about this thick lens, so that's why we have only uh, one, two, three, four parameters here. But if I have the another thick lens as somewhere here, then effective focal length is more complicated, right? So it also function of the the refractive index and distance and coverage of the second lens. I will talk about, uh, I mean, actually, I'll show you uh, in a minute. So for, so for one lens, you always have one effective focal length that yeah. characterizes the entire yeah. lens, yeah. no so, matter what the sides yeah. are. So let's say if you have the 100 lens, but you can always find the one effective focal length. Yeah. So actually, if you have a digital camera, then typically you have multiple lens, or three or four or five. But you only have the one focal length, and you, I mean, they only specify one focal length, right? So they, that is actually effective focal length. So they already compute this whole thing, okay? So, yeah. So that's the, uh, the reason why we introduced this. Uh, concept. And I just want to mention that uh, this, uh, the center ray, which is starting from the object point, and, but it's incident on the center at the first principal plane. And if you uh, remind the, the thin lens case, then you know, at the thin lens, we, that ray is actually just go, just pass through the center of the ray, so, right? So the same here. So that ray is starting again at the second print plane, at the center of the second print plane, and it goes to the uh, image. And of course, if you have the same media, same medium uh, in front of the lens, and the, I should say in front of the front, uh, in front of the principal plane and behind the principal plane, then this angle and this angle are same, right? Because, you know, at the center, you just have a piece of glass, so you know, by the Snell's law, they should be parallel. Okay, so actually, that's about it. So the take-home message is we just talk about the imaging condition. Vulnerable. Uh, anyway, by the way, he's going to talk about the human visual system. So take-home message of the my part is we just talk about imaging condition, which is vulnerable S O and plus vulnerable S I is vulnerable F, and there are some mathematical way to find or derive that condition, okay? So that's, which is the ray transfer matrices. And we just introduced the front, uh, front, uh, front focal, this front focal length and back focal length and principal plane. But I didn't really talk about uh, how to find these principal planes, okay? Right. So let me finish with uh, how to find the principal plane if you have multiple elements, which was the, because uh, we have the two, uh, example of two lenses. So, darken, please. So, initially we had the example that two thin lens, which has focal length is 10, 10, and distance is 5 millimeter, and the object was also 5 millimeter. Uh, by the way, uh, Professor Barbastatis, uh, he posted 
a different way to do it. You know, to find the image where the image is or how big it is and where is the principal plane and what's the effective for so He uh, summarized the, uh, all these different methods and he posted on the Stellar website in the supplement material. So please go to the uh, website and review it. And it looks complicated, but once you've done, then it's pretty straightforward, and you will never forget. You, you, you're not gonna forget. So, you know, please do it. I strongly uh, suggest you. Okay. So let's do. Let's continue how to find the principal plane here. So there are a bunch of different ways. So I'm going to do the first one, the easy way. So uh, let's let's first find the back focal plane first, because you know. The, the definition of the focal plane, if you remind the thin lens, thin lens like this, and this incoming, ra uh, incoming rays, they converge at one point, right? So in this case, let's find the, let's first assume I have the ray coming from infinity, like this. And I do the, the cascade method. So I just consider first lens here. And where is uh, my image? Actually, we already computed, like, um, uh, it's already computed, but uh, so this focal length is, since it's the 10, right? So this distance f. So by the first lens, oops, uh, I draw only one way here is parallel to the optical axis. So that way actually goes to the focal plane, focal point of the first lens, which is 10, right? But we do have the second lens here. So if you do the uh, lens equation, then actually it bends more. So finally what you get is it coming in bend like this, it's supposed to go like this, but it bend more like this. So that this point is uh, back focal point of these two lens system. And if you do the same thing, so you extend this, the parallel ray like this, and if you extend like this, then where they meet, actually that's the that's the uh, the position that position of the second principal plane, and you can do because uh, you have all the numbers. You can easily find the the position of this guy, and so this distance is actually effective focal length, and the distance from the the second lens to the back focal point is actually back focal length. So we just find the second principal plane here. Second principal plane, and you can do the same thing in object size. You start with the uh, point source on optical axis, and at the end you're gonna get the uh, collimated light. So since it's symmetric, so if I have, so it's actually you're gonna put the ray like this and it bend like this and it's final collimate. So if you do the same thing, then you're gonna get the first principal plane here, and this is uh, effective focal length, which is same as before, and you'll get, you, uh, you can find the uh, front focal plane, front focal length, okay? So that's the, you know, just uh, conceptual way to find the principal plane and effective focal length. But if you wanna be, uh, accurate or precise, then you can always use the ray transfer matrix. So uh, let me do this. You have we have two lens, focal length f, and ten. So let's start with the actually this interface to the the, the at the end of the second lens. So we have here alpha O and XO, and here alpha I and XI, right? 
So I have alpha i, x i, alpha o, and x o. And I assume these lenses are thin lenses. So first matrices should be 1 over 1, and negative 1 over f, and 0, 1. And next one is the propagation from here to here. So it should be 1, 0. Actually, it's 4, 1, because this is five, uh, 5, 5. And the second lens, it should be same as the first one, at 1, 1 over uh, negative f, 0, 1. So if you compute this one, then you're going to get this is 1 minus uh, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 5, 1, and 1 minus 1, 10, 1, 0. And you are getting um, uh, it should be one over two, negative uh, three over twenty, and five, one over two, <coughs> and alpha object and x object. So as you remind the uh, thin lens case, which is 1 minus 1 over f, 0, 1. So actually, this guy is one of a uh, effective focal length. So in this case, effective focal length should be 20 over 3. OK? So it, this is how to find the effective focal length by using weight transfer matrices. And you can find the back focal length and front focal length, just cascade the another propagation, you know, just like what we did in class. So here and here, you can find the back focal, uh, back focal plane, back focal length, and front focal plane, and front focal length, and, and you know, first and second principal plane. Yeah. So since, he, since uh, Professor uh, posted the detailed material, he actually he derived four different ways. So Please visit the website and uh, do it by yourself. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, so so far we've been learning about lenses and some sort of image, imaging techniques and principles. But more than that, we've learned about some optical princi pr principles that regulate how light propagates, namely refraction, reflection so far, total internal reflection. So now the question is that how does nature do it in? And how has it evolved over the past several, several years? And it actually comes down to, according to this uh, reference here, to eight different possible configurations of eyes. And just by the way, defining an eye is, is more complicated than just a simple photoreceptor. So an eye, it's a little bit more evolved, like uh, some sort of forming uh, either an image or a shadow-based system. So these, can, these type of eyes can be broadly categorized or divided into chamber eyes, the ones that I'm showing here. OK, so let's look at this eyes here and see what principles apply, right, from what we learned so far. So in C and in D, we can see what? Snell's law, right? So this is refraction. So this type of eyes, again, like our human eye, focus the light and form an image in some sort of photoreceptors located here, right? Then we have also reflection-based. These lenses here, I'm sorry, this mirror base here where the light gets reflected and forms an image in a photoreceptor here. And now we also have another one that is an aperture based, or you can think about this as being as a natural pinhole. And this image is formed by shadows, right? So you see the shadow difference. So these are the, the four types of chamber eyes. But even more um, older type of eyes, we have the compound eyes, as we said in the very first lecture. They are made out of a segmented array of many apertures or many elements, you can think about like many lenses for the case of a re uh, refractive based system. Or for a reflective based system, it's several apertures that reflect the light somewhere here and also 
expose it into some photoreceptive sensor. Or in this case, for instance, here, each one of these uh, uh, segments sees a very tiny field of view and integrates all that field of view into that photoreceptor. So in reality, it's not like uh, the type of images that we're used to, right? It's just like sort of like a blurry version of, that ima of our images in this case. But of course, of very important interest to us is how the human eye works. Because as we know, we've experienced, we have eyes. Uh, it's, it's an extremely robust and very elaborate optical system. I just said one of the problems we've had with the demo is the adaptive to dynamic range. Our eyes can do that very well. We can also go to uh, read a book or just look at, uh, at uh, something far away, and we can focus pretty well too, right? So all these things and all these adaptations regulate these optical princi principles that we presented are actually what made a lot of researchers to try to study the eye and how the eye perceives light. So that's under the, the field of visual perception. So this is the structure of the eye. The eye is uh, essentially a sphere, and it's all covered by some white opaque uh, layer called the sclera. And that basically blocks straight light going through. The only transparent section of the eye is the cornea here. So in the cornea, the light can go through. And the cornea is the first refractive element of the eye. It's curved. It has a refractive index of something like 1.37, which uh, basically is the largest bending of light because it comes from air to this 1.37 element. So that's why you can think of it when you are actually swimming. Uh, it's hard to see. Why? Because the index of refraction of water is 1.33, very close to that of the cornea. So then the, the, the bending of light that occurs in this first layer is very minimal. So after the cornea, we have some chamber filled with a solution called aqueous uh, humor, which basically nourishes the, uh, the eye, especially the cornea, keeps it alive. Uh, that has, uh, is very similar to water. Now we have then the iris. The iris is the element that controls, well, its functional purpose is to control the amount of light that your eye receives. So as we know, the iris expands and contracts depending on the uh, amount of light present in the environment. And actually, it's a, in, in, very impressive. It can go from like two millimeters in diameter to eight millimeters in diameter, depending on the light, light conditions. But it's also responsible for the nice color of the eyes that we we see like blue eyes, green eyes, you know, that's, that's the one to blame. Um, the, the aperture or the hole that we have is what we call the pupil. So after the iris, we have the second most, yep? No, it's, uh, it's due to, and actually it's very, very interesting. So um, no, it basically just blocks the light. It, it acts like an aperture, like of the aperture of your camera. So it would control, if you like photography, it would control the, 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 the speed uh, or the F number of your system. But the light reflected uh, from the eye uh, gets the color in a similar principle to why the sky is blue. And I'll just let you investigate that because actually it's very interesting. And we used to have that problem in the first piece set, why the sky is blue, why clouds are white. And I guess the physical phenomena of why that happens is very interesting. So you guys should read it's in hect. Um, OK, so after the iris, we have this, uh, what is called the crystalline lens, this lens here. This is the second optical component more import, mo most important in, in our eye. It's basically a multi-layer fibrous mass uh, element covered by some elastic membrane that it's transparent. And it can contract and deform itself in such a way that it changes the effective focal length of this lens. But you can think about this, this element as some transparent quasi-onion. Uh, but in addition, it has very interesting properties because this lens is actually a gradient refractive index lens. It's what we, call, what we learned in some classes, the green lens, this element here. It has a refractive index in the core, something like 1.4, and it decays all the way to uh, something like 1.38 to the, to the edges. So the light gets basically, uh, see the transition. So this is similar to the piece at, the piece at one, and it, it basically sees multiple layers of different in indices of refraction and starts bending accordingly. Um, OK, so this lens uh, will, in, in, in conjunction with this cornea, form 
what we call or we could model this system as a dual or double lens optical system. And combined, they have an optical power. And remember, the optical power is 1 over the focal length, um, which it's measured in diopters of equivalent of something like 59 diopters. Just so, so you get an idea for an, an unaccommodated eye or a relaxed eye just looking at infinity. So then after this lens, we have another chamber with another fluid called vitreous humor. And it's, it's, a, it's another fluid that basically gives support to the eye. And uh, going back to a question I think someone in Singapore had uh, in the very first lecture, this, uh, this fluid has a lot of little particles floating, cell debris. Uh, and actually, sometimes you can see them. And maybe many of you have seen them. If you see to the sky or you just squint your eyes and see a, a bright light source, you see the shadows of these little uh, particles that are freely flowing in the vitreous humor. And you can see the fringes if you look carefully of the light diffracting at that. Um, OK, so after that, the light basically gets focused into the retina. We know that the retina is, is composed of photoreceptors, photoreceptive cells, cone and, and rods. And I'm going to explain those in a couple uh, of, of slides. And uh, then we can also identify two other points. We identify here that each of these cells are connected to optical nerves, and they all basically come together into this output that goes to the brain. And this is what constitutes the blind spot. And I also explained that, and we have a fun exercise in a second. And we also have this other region, which is like a, it's a spot of three millimeters in diameter, more or less. It's like a yellow spot. It's called the macula. And it has the largest concentration of cones. And, and I'll explain what is its role, but it's very important. This, just that section here accounts for 90 to 95% of our visual perception. So um, I talked about the ability of this crystalline lens to accommodate, right? Change the focal length. And similar to this demo, that we were changing the distance between these guys. Well, in this case, as I said before, this distance is fixed, right? Unless you have some sort of disease that actually changes the length of your eye, and that actually happens. Um, this is, you, we can think about this fixed. So if we want to focus objects other than infinity, we need to play now with the focal length. Right? So now this lens has to be capable of changing the effective focal length in such a way that it will conserve or preserve the imaging distance here. So here, the, this lens does it by contracting or expanding the ciliary muscles that are control are connected via some fibers to this lens. Right? So in a relaxed state, you see this case here, the radius of curvature of this lens is very large, like closer to like infinity, say, like very flat. And then it focuses nice into the, into the retina, like a plane wave. Whereas for nearby objects, the, these muscles are stressed. So then the radius of curvature of the lens changes. The focal length changes. And now this image is focused into, again, the, the retina. So we can think about some of the uh, conditions uh, that would affect the normal behavior of the lens, of the eye. And the two very important conditions that we have is uh, far-sighted or near-sighted. So in the far-sighted case, for example, our eye lost its ability to focus effectively. And in a relaxed state, it will actually form a focal point. So the back focal point, it will be far away behind our retina. So actually, what you see it would be a blurry image. In the myopia case or near-sighted, you see the opposite. Now the point is, is formed in front of the retina. And again, you see a blurry, blurry signal. And by the way, a far point for a normal, healthy eye, it starts from like something like five meters on. So five meters, more or less, what you consider is still like a far point. So for someone that suffers myopia, typically they see close by objects pretty fine. But far objects that say further than the far point, something like five meters away, they, they become blurry. And uh, the near point, which is the counterpart of the far point, is how close can we see. That's a point that also varies with age. Like normally, like teenagers, the closest they can see is something like 7 centimeters. For us, maybe it's around 10 to 12. You can try later by just trying to focus your notebook. Centimeters. And then if you are like over 60 years old, it goes down to up to uh, 100 centimeters. 
So basically, you can see how the eye starts decaying in its ability to, to modify these uh, crystalline lens. So to correct for these, these uh, conditions, we can use what we've learned so far, positive and negative lenses, right? So let's think about it. Like in this case, the rays are not focusing enough, are not bending enough, right? Because they are basically focusing behind that. So we want to help the rays to focus a little bit more. So a positive power lens or a positive lens like this one allows me to bend the rays inward more, right? And it's essentially what this is happening. The positive power bends these parallel rays more and then assures that this is, uh, um, that this focuses in the retina. So let me ask a question. What do you think happens with the magnification for this case? Any idea? So for those of you that wear glasses, do you guys see the word larger? Magnified? No? They're shaking head? No? Why do you think it's not the case? OK. So the power of the, 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 the optical system, the compound optical system. So if you work out actually the, the power of the cornea plus crystalline lens, which I said is something like 59 for a healthy eye. But in reality, when it's not healthy, it changes. And if you consider the power added by this element here, it still remains. Uh, it, it basically comes down to the same power as the healthy eye. So therefore, you don't add or subtract any, any, any power so therefore, the magnification stays the same. For the myopia case, we can use the opposite. We can use a negative lens, as shown here, to actually bend the rays a little bit outwards, right? So essentially, this is interesting because, again, the myopia case, you cannot, you see far away objects blurry, right? But some objects uh, closer than the far point, you can see them fine. So what the negative lens is doing, and again, going back to these virtual images, is bringing a far away object into a near distance Closer to the far point, as you can see, this appears to come from some virtual point here that is closer from a region that you can see naturally with your eye. So therefore, this is intuitively, this is how this ray makes this uh, lens still project the image into the retina. But as a side effect, the near point, yep. No. And actually, as a fo yeah, that, that was the, the second point that I was going to say. Uh, as, a, as a consequence of this, your near point, which I said that for like a healthy eye would be something like 12 centimeters, becomes uh, long, larger. So people that have myopia, I don't know if there's anyone here, but probably you, you know that uh, sometimes if you want to read a very close by document, you need to remove your glasses. Right? And people just, OK, for a small print, they get off their glasses. And, and for far, far away objects, they put their glasses on and, and, and see. OK? All right. So any other questions? OK, so the retina. The retina has a bunch of cells that are photoreceptive cells that can be classified into two types. Rot, rots and cones, right? So, and we can see here rods and cones. For those of you that like photography, you can think about the rods being equivalent uh, of a high speed black and white film. What, that, what is the meaning of that? It basically means that it's very, very sensitive to light, okay? For very low levels of light, you can, you can, you can detect them very fine, but it's insensitive to color. And it gives you images that are not really good quality, sort of like blurry, blurish type of images, right? The cones, on the other hand, can be thought of as a low contrast or low speed uh, color film. So the cones have cells that are sensitive to red, green, blue. You can are responsible for the colors that we see, and are also responsible of the nice sharp images. So. All around the, the, the retina, we have sort of a combination of both, although as you can see here in the density plot shown here, there's a region that is called the macula. And inside the macula, there's even a smaller region of something like 300 microns 
it's called the fovea, that has the highest concentration of cones. Again, those responsible to, for the color vision. As you can see, the plot just peaks here, and all those no uh, rods, right? This is called the fovea centralis, and that's the central, the, the responsible of the central vision. Uh, and basically, that's the one that I was saying that is responsible for 90 to 95% of the visual perception that we have. So it's interesting to note that in contrast to a normal camera, the sampling of these photoreceptor elements, so you can think of it as like pixels, uh, it's different. Outside the macula, they are large and coarse. As you can see, like the, these rods uh, are just responsible for the, black, the peripheral, peripheral vision and black and white. But in this macula, they are very concentrated and dense. And as a matter of fact, the cones inside this region, so when, when they're here, they have a different diameter than uh, the ones outside. There's something like a factor of two, they are actually thinner, so they are very close packed together. So you can see very sharp images here. Um, we, as I mentioned uh, uh, before, each of these um, photoreceptors is connected to these nerves that all bundle up together and go to the blind spot shown here. Now, have you guys been bothered by a blind spot all your life? Not really. Why? Because as you can see, it's actually just blocking a very small portion of your vision. As I, as I said, a lot of the vision or visual perception happens in this region, right? This is not true if we have a camera. If we have a camera and we have a bunch of bad pixels like that, it might corrupt our system and then we're done. Like if a microscope experiment, for example, forget about it. Like we lose a lot of pixels and then the image gets really corrupted. So I brought a little card. I'm going to pass it around. I have actually multiple of these. So this is a fun experiment. Uh, it has in the, in the top part a little cross and a little black circle. In the bottom part, another cross and a line that is basically truncated, right? So what you're going to do when you get it uh, is that you're going to have the cross to your right side, and you're going to close your eye, right eye, and then you're going to just play with this distance, staring at the cross. So you're going to focus your, your, your left eye at the cross, and you're going to find a position here in which the circle will disappear. Right? Because the, cir the circle essentially will be imaged into this blind spot, and we're not going to see it. But the second one is more interesting, because you do the same thing, and the, the hole here disappears. But not only disappears, it gets filled with a line. So you'll see a continuous line. And it's more shocking, because basically our brain fills that missing information. It's actually pretty interesting. So I don't know if you can help me pass this around. Do I go to the next one? Is this time, Alec? This one? Okay. So take forever. Okay. So this is this is a um, simulation that it was done by a group in Caltech. They were trying to simulate what would be the image that our eye actually is projecting at the retina, what is exactly what we see. And interestingly enough, compared to a normal image of the same scene produced by a CCD camera, as you can see, the image is really blurry in the surroundings, very sharp in the center, as we described, due to the sampling, etc. So the eye tries to take advantage of this fact that the fact that it has a very small, very sharp region in focus as much as it, uh, it can. And the way it does it is by, by uh, jittering the eye, moving it at a, at a frequency of something like 30 to 70 hertz to scan a, a given scene and try to collect as much information to create the scene that we perceive in our brain. And also, there's some interesting image processing to try to account for this blurring, or you can think about, for those of you that are in signal processing, the blurring algorithms embedded in our brains. I think it's pretty interesting how. So the phenomena of moving of the eye, it's called uh, saccading motion. 
Also, the cones and the roads, as I said, are connected with nerves, but it was first proposed by studying the eye of a cat that, and then for humans, that the eye actually has this type of response to a light stimulus. That in some regions is going to be positive, some regions is going to be negative, following what is called the Mexican, Mexican hat uh, trend. And actually, this response is what is uh, responsible for many optical illusions that we see, for example, this one. So what do you guys see? You've seen this one probably before, no? Do you see these flickering gray dots that are really not there, right? And if you try to focus your eye, and if you are like as close as I am to the projector and I'm focusing my eye here, I don't see anything of there. At least at that point, I don't see any gray dots. However, if I focus on another point, right now I'm also seeing these flickering dots. 